Good morning, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and welcome back to Law and Crime Live. This is where we cover some of the most interesting live trials in the country today. And we have a great trial for you today, and I'm going to talk about it in a minute. But first, I also want to say good morning to all of our viewers on the Crime and Investigation channel. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, everybody, we are covering the Claude Tex MacGyver case out of Atlanta. We are live. We're back in that courtroom, and that's a live shot right there. This is about that prominent attorney. He's right there. He's got the white hair, gray suit right there. He is charged with murder in the death of his wife, Diane MacGyver, by shooting her from the back seat of a moving car. Now, he claims that this was all a tragic accident. And yesterday was what we've all been waiting for. It was the day that the gun was examined. What happened in that vehicle? We have a short recap about everything that happened yesterday in regards to the gun. Take a look expert took the stand in the murder trial of prominent Atlanta attorney Claude Tex MacGyver. MacGyver claims the shooting death of his wife Diane MacGyver was an accident. The defense contends the gun accidentally fired while MacGyver handled it in the back seat of the SUV he and his wife were riding in, striking and fatally injuring Diane. The prosecution contends it was no accident and the defendant had financial motives for the killing. Firearms expert Zachary Weitzel took the stand and demonstrated the difference between single action and double action. There's a single action notch on the bottom of the hammer, and then there is a corresponding ledge, so to speak, on the top of the trigger. It's just a very slight movement. Were you, were you able to see? So with double action, you see that the trigger is now set further back. Okay, so from there, I would have to pull the trigger up all the way. So about to there is as far as I can stage it without the hammer falling. But then from this, it's almost the same distance as the, as the single action, but it would have to travel this full distance to fire and calls into question the defendant's story of accidentally shooting his wife while handling the gun. This firearm, um, if I just hold it in my hands like this, um, will it just go off? No. Um, if I uh, <clears throat> sit down with it and hold it down here in my lap, will it just go off? No. Um, if I handle it, like this in any way, will it just go off? No. What will make this firearm go off? Something would have to act on the trigger. And when you say something has to act on the trigger, what do you mean? I mean the trigger has to be pulled river. But on cross-examination, the defense attorney made it clear that firearms can be unintentionally discharged. As opposed to an accidental discharge, there is something that you know of that's called an unintentional discharge, correct? Right. And an unintentional discharge means that one, that one can put pressure on the trigger unintentionally and that the weapon can discharge, correct? Right. For, um, for a number of reasons, including being startled, correct? Right. And again, a, this weapon, as well as any other weapons, can be in it unintentionally discharged, correct? Did MacGyver intentionally shoot his wife for financial gain, or was this just an unfortunate accident? I'm Rachel Stockman for Law and Crime. So as we wait for the live feed in the Claude Tex MacGyver courtroom, there's so much to break down. So let's begin with my very special guest for this morning. First, I have us on set law and crime trial analyst and fellow host, Lise Wheel. Lise, it's great to see you. Great to be here. And joining me via Skype, we have host of the live feed on 11alive.com, Vinny Politan. Vinny, great to have you here on the program. Great to see you, Jess. Vinny, I'm going to start with you. What was the biggest takeaway for you from yesterday's testimony? We were talking about gunshot residue, whether or not the gun was, uh, ha the, co the hammer was cocked back, what mode it was set to. What did you take away? Well, I think it comes back to Tex MacGyver's whole story. Guns don't just go off. And it was clear from everything yesterday in the courtroom uh, that from the expert and from seeing this gun in person that it's not just going to go off. Someone has to put their finger on the trigger. Someone's got to slide that hammer back. And that had to be Tex MacGyver. 
Well, that's a, that's we're, so much to talk about with that, with the hammer and what mode it was right. set to. But before we do, I want to bring in Lise. Lise, one of the issues in the case was that the judge may allow the jury to actually handle the gun and pull the trigger. The defense was not having that. What did you make of it? Absolutely not, because it would put the defense, it would put the jury right there in the in the in the in the position of of finding out how much force it took to pull the trigger. Because the whole issue here is how much force it was in, in that moment, right? Because we know that Tex pulled the trigger. We know that he shot his wife. I mean, that's that's not an issue here. The issue is really going to be um, how much force was it? Because was it an accident? If it was an accident, well, then, you know, it, it could have been a, just a trigger pull, right? Just a hair of a trigger. But if it was, if it took a lot of force, well, then that would go to premeditation. And putting the jury in that spot, in that moment, if the jury says, look, I'm handling it, and it took a lot of force. It took a lot of a pull to do that. Well, then that goes more to premeditation. It took a lot of thinking about it. Tex would have had to sit there and really think about all the force and pull that he would have had to do in that moment. See, Vinny, at least is breaking it down from a legal perspective, but let's let's try to understand this from a gun real, real quick. So double action requires 12 and a half pounds of pressure, single action about two and a half pounds. Do we know what mode it was set in? Do we have an idea? No, no, we have no idea. And the expert actually testified, the prosecution expert testified on cross-examination that there's no way to know. So you have to be logical about this, right? And at least at least it says exactly the way it is. The only way this thing could be an accident for the defense is if that hammer is cocked. So how... Yeah, Vinny, I think we lost your feed right there, so I'm going to bring back right. Lisa real quick. So we were talking about it. Uh, that sounds like reasonable doubt to me. I, I, I've, so far, everything I've seen in this case has been reasonable doubt. Oh, you're looking at it from the defense perspective. The, the I have to. Okay, the prosecution. Well, you have to. But the prosecution. If I'm taking the prosecution perspective, I'm saying, look, he ha he sat there. He had that moment. You've got to you've got to remember that we think of premeditation and we think, oh, it takes weeks or months or at least days to think about premeditation. But premeditation can be planned just in that moment of Tex getting the gun from. Diane and thinking, ah, this is the moment I've been thinking of. Now is the time to do it. Let me pull that trigger back. Now that's is the a, time to do it. That's a great point, Lisa, and I'm glad you brought it up. We keep talking about the motive, but what was going on in his head seconds before? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back and go straight to the courtroom. Welcome back to Law & Crime Live, everybody. We're here covering the Claude Tex MacGyver case out of Atlanta, Georgia. A prominent attorney who was on trial for murdering his wife. That's right, the prosecution says that he intentionally shot her from the backseat of a moving car while the defense is saying it was an accident. And yesterday, they really tried to get into that because the gun experts came on the stand. We talked about gunshot residue. We tried to understand about how the gun was fired. And all the defense was trying to say was that this gun could accidentally go off. What we saw yesterday was the testimony of Zachary Weitzel. He's a gun expert. I want to play some of his testimony. And when we come back, we have a lot to analyze. And again, I'm keeping a very close eye on the courtroom. As soon as trial begins, we're going to jump into it. But again, here's some testimony from yesterday. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to borrow this note card right here to put behind it. So, can you see the white behind it? Okay. That's the distance that the trigger has left to travel. Now, inside the gun, there's a single action notch on the bottom of the hammer, and then there is a corresponding ledge, so to speak on the top of the trigger. And that, this is all happening right up in here. So that interaction is basically something to this effect. So it's a small, small little area of interaction. When you pull the trigger, the trigger is gonna move forward just a little and slip off, and that's where the uh, hammer's gonna fall. So, to demonstrate that with the paper, if you can see it, it's just a very slight movement. Were you, were you able to see? So with double action, you see that the trigger is now set further back. Okay, so from there, I would have to pull the trigger up 
all the way. So about to there is as far as I can stage it without the hammer falling. But then from this, it's almost the same distance as the as a single action, but it would have to travel this full distance to fire. All right, everybody, we have a live feed in the Claude Tex MacGyver courtroom. The lead Atlanta police officer, Detective Aya, is, uh, is taking the stand right now. This should be very interesting. The state is not resting their case. They are still building it up. Let's listen in live to what this detective has to say about the case. Where I grew up to about five years, decided to make a career move to a larger city to see a few more things in, uh, in the line of police work. So. Put out a couple applications. Atlanta Police Department hired me in January 2005, so I made the trip to Atlanta. Okay. And um, when you first got hired by the Atlanta Police Department, how were you designed within the department? Uh, I was assigned to the Field Operations Division, which is our patrol, Uniform Patrol Division. I was assigned to the Zone 5 Precinct, which was out of the CNN Center in downtown. Um, for guess, some years, three or four years, I worked on the street. Okay. And can you tell the jury um, a little bit about your duties and responsibilities there in the homicide department? Um, as a homicide detective, we are responsible to respond to all homicides within the city of Atlanta. Um, we respond to suspicious deaths. We stop for one second. We may need to lose the mic if we give feedback. Maybe we can turn it down a little bit or move something. Okay, so as this witness goes through his qualifications, let's just talk a little bit about the case. Again, via Skype, I have host of the live feed on 11alive.com, Vinny Politan. Vinny, one of the other things that was brought up into uh, the court yesterday was this uh, Diane's blood alcohol content. We know she had a .108. That's typical. Uh, people in that condition can sign of, sort of have issues with walking coordination. But how did that play for the jury? Really, what should they have taken from that? I don't know what you take from it. I mean, it's part of the case, obviously, but um, does she not understand everything is happening in the car? Because remember, she tells uh, the doctor at the emergency room that it was an accident. So maybe it's a way to explain that maybe she didn't know exactly what had happened uh, to her. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I don't think it's a huge factor in the case. Uh, I think it's, it's more about how does that gun go off accidentally? Uh, you know, it, there are gun accidents. But, but in this instant, there, there's just too many things surrounding it that make it look like something way different. Yeah. You know, Lise, we really want to focus on Tex here. But as we talk about, it's interesting, as we talk about the blood alcohol content, his blood alcohol content wasn't tested. Why? I think because they were focused on Diane at that point. I mean, she was the one that was shot. You know, they he was the one focused. who fired the gun, he though. Was a, he was, a, yes, but she had said it was an accident. But that she said it was an accident, and then, but later, remember, he, she was asked whether she wanted to see him, mm -hmm. and she said no, she didn't want to see him. So like, you would think at that point, and there was some gossip going on even before then. You would think at that point, when she said she didn't want to see him, that that the focus would have shifted a little bit onto him, right then and there. Um, I guess my prosecutorial instincts would have kicked up and I would have tested, had him tested right then and then for his black blood alcohol content and that wasn't done. Um, but again, you know, you're talking about the hospital, they're focused on her, they're trying to resuscitate her, she ultimately is not able to, that doesn't happen. So I can understand why that, that didn't happen and, 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 you know, but I don't think her blood alcohol really is, is that much of a focus for the jury. Well, we played yesterday while we were listening to that. It was interesting because at one point she said to the doctor, I'm holding, I held the gun behind right. my back. So there was a bit of confusion. Right, right, right. Was she trying to cover for yeah. him? Yeah. I mean, it was kind of or was strange she, there. Right. Right. And were the prosecution, or was she confused? Or was she confused? No, um, she was in shock, probably. That's exactly true. She right. was in shock. She was right. shot in the she back. Was shot. We right. can't forget that. All right, let's listen back into the live feed in the courtroom and we'll uh, analyze what's happening. No, our files are all electronic for. We upload everything to an electronic database. We keep the original documentation uh, if we need it at the request of the DA's office. Okay. And this blue binder represents what with respect to the homicide file? Uh, just a copy. This is not the actual file. I just took this off the file folder, um, the original file. I don't know, about that big with all the documents we've got. I didn't want to tote that over. So this is just another folder with a file with a report. Okay. Now, could you tell the jurors um, when did you? Um, become involved in this case, and as a result of being contacted, what did you do? 
Uh, I believe it was September 26, 2016, about 1.20 in the morning. It was a Sunday. It was my day off. Um, I think I was in bed. got a phone call, which is typical. I don't know how many times that's happened to me. Um, so uh, Detective Griffin from our um, homicide unit, who works the evening watch, um, calls and explained that there was a, um, a shooting that involved a couple of people in a vehicle, and unfortunately there was somebody that was deceased. So what did you do? Um, got ready. Um, drove into the city. Uh, I live north of the city, so it takes me about 45 minutes to an hour by the time I get a phone call to get here. Um, Detective Griffin had informed me that um, one of the involved parties was already at our headquarters downtown. And then the other involved party, from the information he had, uh, was no longer at the hospital. And the vehicle that was involved was in the hospital in the parking deck um, where a uniformed officer was standing by until um, we decided what we wanted to do with it. So I made the decision to come to headquarters to interview the witness that was there at the time. And who's that witness? Uh, Patricia Carter. She goes by Danny Joe. Okay. And can you tell the jury what time did you get to the homicide office to actually get an opportunity to speak with um, Danny Joe Carter? I think I got there around 2.15. 2.20 in the morning, um, gathered a few things, and uh, started the interview. Okay. Uh, that was the first thing you did with respect to the case? You interviewed Danny Joe Carter? I, I, yeah. I mean, I had received some information from Detective Griffin. People, I printed out a couple of pictures just so I'd have a reference with her, you know, we're all talking about the same people. Okay. Now, um, um, can you tell the jurors... Um, Did you document the interview with Ms. Carter in any way? Yes, I did. And how did you do that? Uh, it was video and audio recorded. Okay. And um, can you tell the jurors um, how long did the interview with her last? My interview was about maybe just under an hour. I think it was around 53 minutes to be exact, but right under an hour. Okay. And um, when you were interviewing her, um, uh, did you threaten her? No, I did not. Okay, did you promise her anything? No. Uh, did you put any words in her mouth? No. Okay. And can you tell the jurors where did the interview take place? Uh, public safety headquarters. Uh, the third floor is the major crimes unit. We have four or five separate interview rooms, and then we have three or four interview rooms where people are in custody that we talk to just for security purposes. Okay. And can you tell the jurors, um, in, your, in the course of your training, uh, during your law enforcement career, have you had classes with respect to um, interviewing witnesses? Yes, I have. And can you explain that to the jury? Um, when I first came on, um, in the course of my slow climb through the department, um, I took a couple of interview classes. I took one down in the Institute of Police Technology and uh, Police Technology and Management, I believe, was the the school down in Jacksonville. All right, everybody, that is Darren Smith, the lead detective in this case. You don't want to miss his testimony. This is a crucial witness for the state and also for the defense. It's going to be interesting to hear what he testifies to, including when he spoke to Danny Joe Carter, the driver of the car. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. I don't want to waste any time. We're here in the Claude Tex MacGyver courtroom. That is Darren Smith, the lead detective in this case about a prominent attorney who's on trial for shooting and killing his wife. Let's listen in live. Um, for what purpose we're going back through what was said, whether, um, I guess, under the sixth series, whether. Uh, do you want me to. No, no, I understand your, your question. Uh, well, uh, why it's being revisited, I think, relates to the six series. Yes. Um, and if there is a, a disagreement as to whether this is um, a prior consistent or prior inconsistent um, or none of the above, then we can talk about it. I, I think um, where we are right now is an area where both could apply. Right. Um, and uh, so that's why I assumed you were allowing some leeway here. But if we need to parse it out statement by statement, I'm happy doing that. Um, there are clearly some areas where it's appropriate. Others, um, my suggestion is don't um, rehash the entire thing because there were plenty of um, 
aspects of what was said that were not challenged. Mm -hmm. um, and so then that would um, not be an appropriate uh, approach here. Mm -hmm. And, and I hope the court and the council can see that's not what I'm doing. I'm really very targeted. You just started, um, yeah. and so I don't know which way you're going. But I, I understand right now, I don't think you've run a foul of a... Uh, and that's why I, I didn't I didn't the first question. I yes. Just, I don't want to put everybody on other stuff. Same. Here. Yep. So we're on the same wavelength, yeah. and um, I will um, understand if there's an objection if um, we're straying outside that. Thank you. Sure, keep going. Um, and uh, Detective Smith, um, did Danny, Danny Jo Carter tell you during your interview with her the very first time that there were scary people approaching the car? Yes, I don't, I don't recall if she used the word scary, but I think there was people she was concerned about. Okay. That's what she told you? Yes, so she would, uh, uh, yeah, it was, they were concerned about people coming up in the car. She was, anyways. So, did you ever, while you were there on the Emory University campus, did you ever go into the emergency room? No, I did not. Okay. Um, at any time while you were at Emory, um, did you ever see um, either the defendant or attorney Maples? No, I was under the impression from Detective Griffin that they had already left the hospital. Um, now, when you got back to the um, um, secure location for the vehicle, what did you do after that? Locked it up, um, returned back to headquarters, um, tried to get some information together um, as part of the initial case file, what we're looking at. And by then, some of the other detectives from the Daywatch uh, unit came in, so we started discussing the case and, and go forward. Okay, so this is Darren Smith. Okay, he's the lead detective. He's a prosecution witness. But Vinny, you tell me, how many times do we see prosecution witnesses being brought in this case that are really helping the defense's case? Yeah, yeah there, there are definitely some problems. And, and, you know, when you have a list of like 90 witnesses for a case like this, it, it makes you wonder a little bit. I think the prosecution has done a great job with the demonstrative evidence in trying to show the jury what happened and bringing them to the scene. I think where they've fallen a little short is you've got a lot of inconsistencies. But the bottom line, as a prosecutor, it's about putting it out there. You're not hiding anything. You're seeking the truth. It's the defense that has a, a, a different motive inside the courtroom. Yeah, this is Darren Smith, and he's basically saying, Danny Joe told me that there were people, they were concerned about people coming up to the car, and he himself said, she never told me about a conversation that she had at the hospital that Tex told her not to tell the police uh, that I was in the car. That basically defeats the influencing witness charge. And why this is a state witness that's really helping the defense's case, we keep seeing this over and over and over again. Now, unfortunately, well, we do have to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to jump right back into the courtroom. We don't want you to miss anything, so we'll be back after the short me message break. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. That's Darren Smith, the lead detective in the Claude Tex MacGyver case, a husband who is on trial for shooting and killing his wife. Let's listen in right now. I think he made the, the statement that, you know, at some point, I think I need to come talk to you. Uh, I think we had scheduled up a time for the following day. I, you know, I told him I was there at 7 in the morning, 8, 9, or 10, whenever he wanted to come in. Um, he indicated he would call me the next day to set up a time to come in. Now, did you ask him any questions at that time about what occurred on the inside of the SUV? No, I don't like to have those conversations over a phone. I'd rather have them in person. Okay. And did you doc document the... Um, um, this vehicle um, in any way? Yes, I did. Okay. How did you document it? Uh, two ways. I see photographs and then I drew a, a, a diagram just to give me a better idea of looking at it. Okay. I'm show you an exhibit. This is State's Exhibit 494. Can you tell the jurors, do you recognize and can you identify 494? Yes, this is... Okay, everybody, that's Darren Smith, the lead detective in this case, talking about when he searched the vehicle, the crime scene. The vehicle is the crime scene in this case. So we're going to talk about it when we come back from this short commercial break. There's a lot to analyze in the Tex MacGyver case. 
everybody. That's a live feed into the Atlanta courtroom for the Claude Tex MacGyver trial, a prominent attorney who's on trial for the murder of his wife, Diane MacGyver, by shooting her from the back seat of a moving car. Now, on the stand right now is Darren Smith, the lead detective. Let's talk a little bit about what's been happening so far today. Again, I'm here with long crime trial analyst and fellow host here on the program, Lee Wheel. Lee, you're watching this. We, we've been seeing what he talked about. The lead detective in this case is not saying everything I think the prosecution wants him to say. This, uh, that's right. This is now the lead detective. And if you're a prosecutor, you really want someone out of central casting, right? You want someone that's going to sit up sit up there and he's going to be strong and he's just going to be very determined in what he said and very, you know, just this, these are the facts and this is how it was. And hey, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is why you should find for the state my side, the prosecution. And that's really not what you have here with, with this state's witness. You have someone who's a little bit tentative. You guys are watching this. You're seeing this witness a little bit tentative. He kind of just answers really almost as if he's, as if, as if he's on the cross-examination sort of side. He answers with a yes or no until he's sort of answered and given another question and prodded to give an answer. And then even with his answers, he's not really giving, I think, what the state would want. I'll just give you one example. He's asked about, you know, uh, the, the best friend here, Diane's best friend, who was actually the witness or the, the driver, Danny Joe, who was driving the car. And he's asked about whether she said anything to text, say anything to you about, um, you know, saying that you weren't driving that day, which of course would be a bad thing if you're Texas lawyer, because that would be obstruction of a witness. And he says, um, no, she didn't say anything about that. She didn't say that I shouldn't say, you know, that I was there. Well, that's bad if you look for uh, at count five of the indictment, which the prosecution says it actually happened, this count actually happened on the date of the accident or the crime, depending on how you look at it, the 25th of September. They, they pin themselves right to that date, on or about the 25th of September. Well, if you've got your lead detective saying it didn't happen on that date, that's problematic, Jesse. I know. Now, this is sort of the beginning of his testimony. It's curious to see what he will eventually right. testify to more. But so far, not a great witness for the not prosecution. Of, uh, let, let, let's listen in, Lisa. Uh, maybe we'll learn a little bit more about what he discovered in the investigation. Seat. So, uh, with the short distance between the two seats, um, I didn't believe it was necessary to try to figure out that distance based on my experience because it would just give a range possibly you know, up to two feet, and it wasn't any more than very than two feet, I believe, distance between the two seats anyways. Um, you um, described um, well, strike that. You said that you found a pristine bullet. Yes. What does that mean? To me that this particular bullet, it was a um, full metal jacket, which is what we target practice and qualify with and get issued to the department um, for targeting qualifications. Um, what I mean pristine is that it didn't appear to have any, um, the bullet seemed to be intact. It hadn't it mushroomed or shredded apart like a, a full jacket at hollow point wood, which is our duty ammo. It, it was solid. And you could, actually, you could actually see two markings on the bullet itself to the visible eye. And um, when you were processing the vehicle, did you look at the vehicle uh, interior with your own two eyes? Yes. Okay. Can you tell the jury on the dashboard or the ceiling or the floorboard anywhere, the doors, did you see anything that appeared to be like a ricochet mark or anything? No, I did not. Okay, that was an interesting little moment there. I want to talk about it again with the host of the live feed on 11alive.com, Vinnie Politan, who's been following this case. Vinnie, did you hear what I just heard, that tra the trajectory of the bullet was from down to up? Wouldn't that indicate the defense's case? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I mean, if you're in the back seat and you've got, you've got a gun, this is not a real gun, in a bag, I'm just going to tell well, this thank down. Well, thank goodness. Thank goodness. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Tilt this down. I mean, if you got it on your lap, if you're pointing it like on the hip, they had the 3D demo, we had it by his hip, and again, it's going slightly up. If you have it on your lap, you can just tilt it up very, very simply. I, I think it's it's consistent, perhaps, with both arguments. But I want you to talk about the bullet for just one second. Full metal jacket bullet. 
That's the one that can pierce the back of that seat and all the metal stuff that is between uh, the gun and Diane MacGyver. Only a full metal jacket would do that. Hollow Point probably wouldn't have made it to strike Diane MacGyver. He had both types of rounds in that gun, but the one that was fired was the full metal jacket. The only one that would have pierced the seat and pierced Diane MacGyver. And in other words, since it's a revolver, you can spin it and choose which bullet would be fired. Am I correct in thinking that way? Absolutely, and I think that's what prosecutors are going to argue. Yeah. And don't, right. don't forget, Danny Joe heard a click, click, click. She said it was the door, but maybe it was something else. That's a very good point, Vinny. Stand by. We're going to listen more into the courtroom, and we have a lot to discuss. Let's listen in live. Again, that's Darren Smith, the lead detective in the Claude Tex MacGyver case. The question becomes, even though this is a prosecution witness, is he doing more harm to the prosecution's case or really helping the defense's case? That becomes the question. We'll take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll go straight into the courtroom. Stay tuned. There's a lot to talk about. Welcome back to Law and Crime Live, everybody. We're covering the Claude Tex MacGyver case out of Atlanta, a prominent attorney who's on trial for shooting and killing his wife, but he is saying it was all an accident. They're in a break right now. There's a conversation being had about an issue with the last witness, uh, Darren Smith, the lead detective on the stand, was on the stand. So let's kind of analyze about what's been happening here. I want to bring in, again, host of the live feed on 11alive.com, Vinnie Politan, who's been following this case very carefully. Vinnie, uh, Darren Smith, who was just on the stand, there were some interesting tidbits about this, particularly how he was conducting this investigation. Namely, we saw that Stephen Maples, who was uh, Tex MacGyver's attorney at the time, was presenting how he felt that the gun was went off in the car. But if you heard very carefully, Darren Smith said um, he showed me how the gun was handled based upon the information he knew at the time. Why did he add that statement in his testimony today? And also, are you getting the flavor that the state is saying, well, how did you interview Tex properly? Did, you didn't ask him how the gun went off in your 26-minute interview? Something seems amiss. What do you make of it? Well, th this is really troubling, especially from my perspective as a former prosecutor, right? Here you've got the person who shot and killed the victim. They are talking to you. Lock them into a story. Open-ended questions are great, but when he says, I'm handling the gun, or the gun just went off, all right, how did it go off? How are you handling the gun? You know, and, and it has given him an opportunity now to get this accidental theory and his testimony in front of this jury without being properly cross-examined. It's exactly what happened in the George Zimmerman case down in Florida. Zimmerman's story got in front of the jury, but those detectives in that case never locked him into a story, never followed up on any questions that were significant, like exactly, you were handling the gun, how were you handling it? Where were you pointing it? When did it go off? Were you asleep? Were you not asleep? I mean, all those questions weren't asked. It was just very gray and vague, and that helps Tex testify without testifying in court and without being cross-examined. And he was, le Mr. Maples left the room for two minutes and got Tex. Who knows what that conversation was? Uh, Vinny, stand by. I know we have to let you go, but before you do, I want to really play very quickly for you. This was yesterday when the gun expert took the stand, Zachary Weitzel. He accidentally discharged the gun. And if you're looking at a case where the defense is saying this was all an accident, could this have been any better to watch? Let's play that clip for you right now. They're designed not to work in that case. If the gun is in a single action, so with a hammer cocked, it's primed, it's ready to be fired. The only way that the, the gun will fire is if the trigger is pulled and then held to the rear long enough for the hammer to fall. So if you were to pull the trigger, but then release the trigger, and I'll put my finger here so that you, I could feel it if it went through. It doesn't touch because you notice the trigger, oops, the trigger actually moves forward with the hammer if I don't physically depress it. The gun expert accidentally discharged the gun. Vinny, final thoughts on that. I mean, we're talking about a case where did the gun, could it be accidentally discharged? It may only require two and a half pounds of pressure depending upon what mode it is. When you saw that, what did you make of that? No, I, I, to me, what it's really all about is how is that hammer cocked? Why is it cocked? When was it cocked? 
And I think they're, they're, we know there's no burden of proof on the defense, but I think it's up to them to try to come up with a reasonable explanation as to why that hammer was caught when Texas' hand was in the bag on the gun, because that's all on him. And, and I believe it was, the, the hammer was back. Um, it, it, it had to be. It had to be unless this was a murder. Yeah, it's a great point, and that is really what the jurors are going to ultimately have to deliberate about. Vinny Politan, thank you so much for coming on. It was great to have you. Great to see you. Great job. Thank you, thank you. We can't wait to have you back to talk more about the Tex MacGyver case. Now, before we go back into court, I'm keeping a very careful eye on it. They haven't resumed the, case, the trial yet. I want to play for you some of the testimony of Michael Knox from yesterday. And when we come back, Lee Sweel and I have a lot to discuss in this case. Stay tuned. Take a look at this clip. Uh, this is uh, State's Exhibit 285A. Um, again, can you take a look at this photograph and if you could tell the jurors the position of the hands in this photograph, um, wherein the fingers are in a slightly downward position. Can you tell the jurors, is that hand position consistent or inconsistent with the analysis that you did in the vehicle with respect to the trajectory? it would be inconsistent. All right, everybody, we are waiting. We're on break right now in the Claude Tex MacGyver case, but there's so much to talk about. I don't know even where to begin, but I'm going to try. Again, I want to bring in host of, uh, I was going to say, fellow host here on Law and Crime, um, Lise Wheel. Lise, so, we're, we're, we, again, I want to talk about the gun because the gun became right. such a big issue yesterday. The plastic the bag. The trigger happy gun the tr expert. The trigger happy gun right. expert. The plastic bag. The plastic bag. Can you sort this out for us? So if right. the gun was in the plastic bag, what do you take from that, first of all? Does that give you the indication why was the gun in a plastic bag to begin with? Well, it was, remember, it was up front first, right? Diane had it, Diane had to hand it back. And we, we know that. I mean, we have the driver. We have her best friend driving the car, which adds a whole element. element. Sure. So the gun was in the plastic bag handed back to Tex. Now, we, depending on who you believe, whether he was asleep or whether he was, you know, maniacally planning this murder in the back, um, wouldn't, you know, and it's in the, in the bag, so it's... Uh, it's it's back there now. It doesn't really, in a sense, matter because he's got it. Whether he takes it out of the bag or not, um, it's but it, it's in the bag it when tell he you passes like, it back to when he but, when she passes it back to him. But is it an idea that if someone says, you know what, he wanted to plan this, right? He kept wouldn't it he, in the bag so that the gunshot residue wouldn't get on right. him. Right? Am I stretching? Uh, it's a good idea, but the thing, to go even further than that, though, it's, it's part of, I think, though, would you be so, if you were planning a murder, right, because we've all said to this, this just looks like an accident, but if you were so smart, let me just take it to further step, if you were just so smart, you would make it, look, you would make a murder look like an accident, Right? I mean, that's kind of what you would try to do. You would be, you wouldn't plan a murder to look like a murder. You would make a murder look like an accident. That's what you would do. And so part of that would be putting it in a plastic bag. Right. Because who would, I mean, who would plan a premeditated murder in the back seat of a car with your wife's best friend as an eyewitness to this murder and right near a hospital and not name three hospitals right with you in a plastic bag? Or would that plastic bag, as you say, really be more part of, hey, it's, it's to protect the evidence, you know, and, and yeah, you're near a hospital, but as we've said, they were more taking care of Diane as opposed to looking at Tex and getting his blood alcohol tested. I think the prosecution has been showing a lot of different motives here. It's not right. just financial. It's That's also th that Diane was a shrewd businesswoman. Right. She was kind of tough. She was right. even a little mean to Tex. So you made a great point before, Lise, about we don't know what was in his mind in the moments before no. the shooting. Maybe she said something to him about his weight and he flipped off. And remember, they had been drinking. But right. So much to talk about, but that is not the only case that uh, we focus here on law and crime. There's another case that I want to talk about very quickly uh, as we wait for the live feed in the Claude Tex MacGyver case. It is a case out of Ohio, and it's a bit strange, so um, it's disappointing to hear that this is how it resulted. But it's a case of William Knight. He's a man who's on trial for shooting and killing an unarmed man after going to his house to just seemingly recover a dirt bike that he believes was stolen from his son-in-law. Everybody get those facts? It's very strange. And when he got to the house, an altercation erupted, and he ended up shooting this man. And But he is claiming Mr. Knight 
that this was self-defense. We have a short preview about this case that we're going to be covering here on Law and Crime. Take a look. Ohio man accused of shooting and killing an unarmed man in a dispute over a stolen dirt bike is set to begin next week. 64-year-old William Knight is charged with murder and assault stemming from an altercation with 24-year-old victim Keith Johnson. The dispute was over a dirt bike reportedly stolen in 2016 from Knight's son-in-law's garage. The victim had the pilfered bike in his possession and was attempting to sell it on Facebook, according to authorities. Knight and his family arranged a meeting with Johnson to discuss the sale of the bike when everything went terribly wrong. Knight alleges the victim tried to run over his daughter Michelle with the dirt bike when confronted with the stolen property. Ma'am, they tried to kill my daughter. My okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Did you just shoot the man? I had to. He's trying to. Okay. He tried to run into my daughter. Okay, hold on. Okay, okay. Johnson's family contends the bike was not stolen and that he purchased it from another seller. Is this a case of self-defense or cold-blooded murder? Again, we'll be covering that case next week. You don't want to miss it, as bizarre and tragic as it is. So again, as we wait for the live feed in the Claude Tex MacGyver case, I want to talk to Lise Wheel one more time uh, before our break. What did you make of Darren Smith this morning so far, the lead detective, the lead detective. In, in this case? I, I think problematic for the state because he's just not this dy dynamic character that you want to have roll in. Look, he's going through very methodically and saying, this is what I did. I went from, you know, the interview with Danny Joe there, the yeah, eyewitness at the, at the scene, and I went from her straight to the other, you know, to, to really trying to track down things. Uh, it, it exited the search warrant of the car, tried to, you know, uh, get all this stuff. But he's just he's not really pulling it together for the state as we talked about a little bit earlier you go through one of the one of the counts the witness tampering counts and he doesn't bring it in I mean at all he goes right to that date and says no Danny Joe didn't tell me to say that I you know that Tex had said anything about my not being in the car so he just doesn't give it bring it in for the state at all on that count and then we're starting to go through now the testimony about what what Tex actually said to him in that interview and the very first thing he said was uh, Danny Joe said to him right. that Diane was fussing about Tex falling asleep and then right. she's not, I mean that's right. the whole that's thing That's exactly there. the thing exactly so if, she, if, if that's if that's the case then that really is an accident for the defense and that's what they're arguing and again you know reasonable doubt that's all the defense has to say Tex was asleep and he had a history of falling asleep and, and you know just I mean he had a problem with that falling asleep and that they were concerned about the neighborhood that's, that, that's, that, the that's big point. another point, exactly. Uncomfortable about the neighborhood. Exactly. And it goes to intent. Whether or not it's true or not, it goes to intent and sort of how the way they felt yeah. about the neighborhood. And a lot to talk about. We'll talk more about all of these characters when we come back from this short break. Welcome back to Long Crime Live, everybody. We're waiting for a live feed back in the Claude Tex MacGyver case. That's the case we've been covering today. It's the case we've been covering all week. It's an exciting case out of Atlanta about a prominent attorney who's on trial for shooting and killing his wife, Diane. But it's not so, not so simple because him and his team are saying that it was all a tragic accident. Again, I'm here with Lise Wheel. Bef uh, Lise, before we go back to court, and it might be starting up soon, the prosecution keeps trying to get a flavor of Annie Anderson, who right. was a, a masseuse, a massage therapist. And we heard um, a Detective Smith, who's the lead detective in this case, say that Annie Anderson um, accompanied MacGyver to the police station. What are we getting at here? Was, is, is the prosecution oh, trying to say that, this, there's, that he was two-time in Diane? They can't say it out loud and on direct or cross or anywhere. They can't actually come out and say that because I don't think they have any evidence unless they, it comes out later in trial that they do. But look, they don't have to come out with a motive. They don't need to establish in, in law, right? right? But we know as jurors, the jurors, they want to hear a motive. They want to know why. Why would Tex do this? And why would he do it in such a weird way? Okay. So money is absolutely a good motive, but a mistress, sex, is absolutely another good motive, and it's great to have two motives. So if you can establish or try to establish or kind of wend it in there, weave it in there by innuendo, then you're, they're going to try to do it. And it's innuendo to say, have the jurors thinking, why would Tex bring his masseuse to a t an interview with the police just so shortly after yeah. his wife, so the love of his life has been tragically killed in an accident. Trying to understand Tex MacGyver's behavior has been the 
really the goal of this case, trying Excellent. to understand it. And, Excellent. And, and one of the ways that we try to understand it is his police interview. So we're talking about his police interview today because Detective Smith is on the stand explaining it. But we have a short clip of when this was played in court last week of Mr. MacGyver's police interview. Take a look. What's the next thing that you that you can remember after you got in the vehicle? So Danny was driving, right? Okay. I was um, in the back seat. In the back seat. Okay. And what's the next thing that you can? I know you said he kind of fell asleep there. What's the next thing that you can remember? Uh, okay. I, I remember the turn going from I twenty onto the connector. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty hard ride. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but guaranteed to wake me up. And um, the next thing I remember is we're going down. And I knew then that we were no longer on the connector. Right. And I came up and I said, girls, where are, we, where are we and what's happening here? Right. Because we were clearly off our, our path. Right. And uh, what do you remember after that? So we went through an area I thought that was particularly dangerous okay. at night. I'd seen police vehicles there. It's, it's a route I take from my office to her office. And I quickly said, uh, this is a big mistake, and we're in a place that we don't belong. Right. And, uh, of course, here we are in an almost new SUV and two women in the front seat. Right. Uh, so anyway, uh, they made a couple turns, and things were not going well. And Brian said, we'll be on Piedmont shortly. And uh, I said, yeah, I'd like to, if you don't mind, please hand me my gun. Right. And he was in the center console. So uh, Diane reaches in, pulls it out, uh, hands it back to me, and uh, by then we may have been on Piedmont. Anyway, I'm relatively satisfied that we're out of that kind of area. Right. And I guess I just uh, laid back again and went to sleep. Danny Joe came to a stop, and uh, anyway, I just just time to wake up, uh, but she came to a stop, and uh, I was handling the gun, uh, and I realized it was in my lap, right. and it went off. Okay. As we wait for the live feed in the Claude Tex MacGyver case, and we will be back in that courtroom live, there's something that's been bothering me, Lise. Ever since I've heard of this case, when he was initially charged with involuntary manslaughter and reckless conduct, my issue was... Okay, I'll take the presumption that there was a danger from outside, and he took his gun out. Right. Why would he fall asleep if he was exactly. in a dangerous area? Exactly. You would think that his senses then would be heightened, right? He's got the gun. Right. He's protecting these two women. He's in the back seat. He's looking left and right. He's making sure that they're okay. And then he falls asleep again. I mean, yeah, there been, had been some drinking, and so that could sort of numb you a little bit. But you would think, no, at that point, you would, your senses would be heightened because you're driving, and, and he's not the one that's having to drive, right? It doesn't make any sense that that, that it doesn't fit. Well, here's the, here's the other way of looking at it. If you and I were driving, I don't handle guns. So if me to take out a gun, I would be alerted. But, this is the first but, time but I'm holding. But Tex does, though. Right. He knows guns. That's he, the he point, right? He teaches guns. He's been teaching other people about guns. He, and he takes a pride in that because it's exactly that. He teaches other people about guns and gun safety. That's a big thing for him. Yeah. So for him to be handling the gun, it'd be like, okay, ladies, kind of, I've got this, right? I've got it. Literally, I've got the gun, but also, I've got it. I'm in the back seat here. You handle the driving and the looking around for where we're going. I've got the gun. And it works both ways, his knowledge of gun safety and teaching it, because right. you could say that, but then the flip side of it is the prosecution says, if you knew so much about gun safety, then why would it just be going off? Go, you it wouldn't go off? be. You wouldn't have the you know the trigger the trigger going off. You wouldn't be you know doing that exactly. Do you think the gun was hammered? You know that's it. It looks like it from from just for the perspective of the gun expert, it looked like it would have been. But you know that both sides are going to argue their side on that one. Yeah, and that really is the is main the key, is issue the key, in this exactly. case. Exactly, and we don't have it from the expert. No, we don't. We don't. But th today's an interesting day. We have the lead investigator on the stand. It's interesting to hear the perspective of how this all came about in his investigation. The court took a short break. We're going to have to go to a, a quick break. But when we come back, we want to hear more from Darren Smith, who's been a very interesting witness, and a lot of his testimony has been going against the the narrative put forward by the prosecution. So we'll be back after this short break, and when we come back, we'll go straight back into the courtroom. Stay tuned.